Oh my god, I'm so it's because I don't I don't like hardware really. I'm not really a fan of hardware, so <coughs> But the operating system I can definitely tweak out on that a lot. So now I've got the OS book here. And let's see what we've got as far as the book. Okay, I'm not using that anymore. I have to use the. Have to use the. Uh, yeah, this one. Ask ask an AI assistant. Hmm, what should I ask? Let's see. <coughs> what I can ask. Ask an AI assistant. Okay, let me ask an AI assistant. Less than 600, try a smaller file. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. So, the first thing I want to do is I want to look for process management for these things. So I just asked, um, what is this book about? Um, <clears throat> I'm also going to, um, I did a great job with the other book, uh, the hardware book, asking what was that book about? What were the main things that it talked about? And I got a very good picture of what, it, what the book was about. So I'll do that for this, this book. topics structure functions management so things right here the main functions of an OS process memory and file and IO see with the focus on process management memory management file system IO Emphasize both theoretical and practical applications. Real world OS implementations challenges. <coughs> works for both low level, works works as both low level hardware interface and high level software abstractions. So works both in low level application and high level theory. And this is this is actually what my assignment is here. Now, this is really the stuff that I like to talk about, right? So I'll check where it says process management. It says these three things: process, memory, file, and I/O. What are these things? So, if, if I'm thinking about it, processes are the various applications that are running that the OS is managing. Memory, memory management is the the physical memory that all those processes have to operate in. So the OS is also managing the processes in the memory. And then file and IO management, uh, file and input output management. Operating systems manage file storage, access permissions, and coordinate input output activities to ensure seamless interaction between hardware devices and applications. So it means that the OS is also managing all the hardware parts, including the hard drive, and the files on the hard drive, and the interactions of various apps on the you know, with each other on the hard drive and on the other uh, hardware devices <clears throat> so operating system plays a critical role as an intermediary between user applications and hardware it simplifies resource management by abstracting complex hardware details allowing users and applications to operate without needing an in-depth hardware knowledge so <clears throat> Yeah, that's true. If you're just interfacing with the GUI, then the OS makes itself available to the consumer, to the user, the human user, through the GUI, through an easy-to-use GUI. 
um, <clears throat> but the um, that's why I don't have a big fascination with hardware because the heart really the hardware's job is just to make itself available to make itself usable by the OS and then the OS uh, as long as it can access and manipulate the hardware then the hardware's job is finished the hardware side's you know job is finished and uh, whether you consider that glamorous or not I don't know but uh, the OS from there is is uh, and there's I, I think that there's much more management technical management uh, needed in the uh, operating system uh, and included and credited uh, not only IEEE so it's I, I'm sure it's not because nobody knows about it so anyway that's what we that's what I have uh, I think we have uh, for that to answer that question process management file management yeah, and then there was a this is the file I O here and what was the other one so, memory right memory management so you see the file I O management here answer any memory no well pos 6 needs does it need memory management anyway pa uh, that that uh, uh, <coughs> this is a type of unix um, all right let's go through them 31 instances system calls for process management processes in linux all right unix linux and android right i haven't seen actually this yet so i would like to go just go through the table of contents right now actually Uh, okay, you've got the OS, the history OS of OS. Different types of OSs. OS concepts. This is a general description of what types of devices would need, machines would need OSs. Um, smart card OS sounds, I don't know what the smart card OS is, that sounds interesting. The embedded OS is IoT, handheld uh, OS, the PC OS, multiprocessor OS, a little bit more powerful, the server OS. It's part of the more now more part of a data center and then the mainframe OS uh, which is uh, supercomputers smart card operating system I don't think I've heard before let's check that from where every smart card has an OS This is, a, this is what I was thinking of smart card. This is looks just like a card, a credit card. This is a SIM card. This looks like a SIM card or like a credit card. So, and I happen to have one in my 
wallet. Most uh, modern bank cards look like this. They have this chip on them. And uh, <clears throat> another thing what it's saying is that we can put these smart card operating system platform and create with API to provide security functions, these inputs and outputs are accessible, but the transmit and receive lines fixed with serial port. IoT devices. smart card OS this makes sense there to get is the smart card build the standards for governments with national security in mind these are EIDs called EIDs And here it is right here. Smart card, typically a type of chip card, is a plastic card that contains an embedded computer chip that stores and transacts data. And that's interesting because it stores data. First of all, it stores data. It is a, an embedded computer chip, uh, which means it's like an embedded device and has so it has an embedded OS operating system. So this any card that has this chip has an operating system, an embedded operating system on it. It has a processor, memory, and I.O. interfaces. It can be installed at different locations. So let's see. Card operating system is a software program to the smart card microprocessor. Yeah, the software which is programmed to the smart card microprocessor, the chip, the OS program to the chip. It manages communication protocol, storage, security services, and applications. So it's it it <coughs> it's acting autonomously, just like any OS acts autonomously. Um, <coughs> anything that has this chip has an OS in it that is able to act autonomously. Softlock card operating system. Smart card operating system developed by Softlock. Okay, so besides <coughs> This is how small the, usually I'm used to like devices, IoT devices, but um, this is, uh, these chips with OS's on them can just, can just be cards. They can just be the size of credit cards actually, they look like credit cards. So here are a lot, this is a card logics, I think it's a different one. And these OSs would be able to, because just like, a, I mean, these cards, these smart cards, um, because they can have an OS programmed on them, they would be able to do anything that other devices with OSs can do, like, you know, Androids or, you know, <coughs> any other devices, IoT devices, cameras whatever, drones, whatever other autonomous devices, physical devices.
question is how much data can they put on them so uh, the uh, anyway the smart card is this is one of the uh, uh, topics and so it's it one of the more advanced yet yeah, is so usually when you when you progress through the pages <coughs> The more advanced topic is the the last one, uh, and is actually the point of the topics. So, actually, this is, these are bigger computers, but the point is the smart card operating system. So, what are the newest smart card operating systems? Right? What are the newest and best smart card operating systems? For example, right? What's better than smart card operating systems? This is a, this is a topic that we can just uh, look at. Beyond traditional physical cars, including advanced technology and security, the invention is called like contactless cards, biometrics, biometrics, right? Multifunctional cards for multi multiple applications, uh, combining payment with access control, biodegradable options, uh, eSIMs and digital wallets. eSIM, oh eSIM, eSIM and digital wallets. The eSIM, I think, is like it goes into your phone. A SIM that goes into your phone, an additional port in your phone, uh, <coughs> can replace the smart card. Um, so it merges with the mobile device, and just think of that. Also, the the SIM itself has an OS in it, independent of the Android OS. <coughs> 5G enabled connected car. Yeah, a lot of these EVs coming from China, they're going to be 5G enabled. They're going to have a lot of this. You can autonomously pay for services like fueling or charging through secure in-car payment services. So for example, you've got those swipe machines at the gas stations. You only need to use your card, which you thought is your bank card, but actually has one of these OSs in it. It has the chip, it has the OS in it, but now that will just, uh, that will also be in your car and you can just stop at the station don't need to get out of your car it will detect the gas station terminal and uh, pay through your car uh, this looks like there's also wearable payments embedded in smartwatches fitness bands gaining traction and then these eSIMs can also be inserted into these wearable payments like uh, the smartwatches. That that would be, <coughs> you might see that. Overall, physical smart cards are still widely used. Digital alter, like the bank card. A bank card is a smart physical smart card. Digital alternatives like eSIMs, digital wallets, and connected devices offer more seamless integrated experience signaling a shift toward a cardless future, right? Uh, <clears throat> other countries are already doing that. For example, China doesn't use cards. They use phones, mostly. Um, and they, and, uh, they um, are probably have developed these, have a lot of these 5G-enabled uh, connected cards, and they're probably using those already mm. 
Yeah, but the the Americans just love their greenback, so they haven't even <laughs> caught on to paying with the phone. Um, <laughs> Let's see what else we have here. So uh, anyway, what does this have to do with uh, process management, memory management, and uh, and uh, file I/O? Uh, question I had was the um, the um, how big uh, uh, how big in data data size is the uh, uh, is the OS on a smart card? Yeah, it's quite small, just like other embedded OSs. Or embedded OSs are very small. Yeah, it says due to the limited storage and processing power, but uh, they'll change that. Uh, it says between 8 KB and 128 KB, that is very small. <clears throat> well, Windows, Windows is very good at reducing that size, and Android is a is a competitor is a very good competitor to Windows. Um, so I think uh, Android and Windows would be very good at uh, uh, reducing the size of their OS to uh, accommodate this. With some modern multifunctional cards requiring slightly more space but a potential of the 256 KB right uh, small footprint is designed to efficiently manage basic operations like authentication encryption secure data storage without the need for complex graphical interfaces and multitasking capabilities found in large OSs so there you're talking about like PAW 6 like UNIX um, Cards used for advanced applications such as high security ID or payment cards might lean toward the higher end of this range due to additional security features and cryptographic functions. <clears throat> now you can ask who is leading uh, embedded OS. It's going to be a Unix type variant probably. Or second probably Windows or something. Q and X free RTOS, Amazon free RTS, VX, Zephyr, Qnix and Integrity. Okay, let's see uh, let's see what Q and X is. See Unix, Q and X, anything that says X has got some kind of Unix in it. So the now, if I ask, uh, I change this to who is the leading smart card OS. This is a Java card OS J Cop by NXP. Okay, BIOS allows trust sec, infinite hardware, biometric security. Okay, let's just try this one. This uh, Java card OS J Cop by NXP. Let's see what that is. It is an operating system J Cop. It's an operating system for smart cards and other secured embedded systems. Well, something about Java, right? Java card based operating system building upon NXP successful field. So, okay. Java card open platform JCOP, NXP semiconductor JCOP. Okay, let's put in NXP JCOP. There it is right there. It's the NXP JCOP, right? Okay, JCOP pay, Java card open platform with JCOP right here. Smart card operating system for the Java card platform. So, JCOP is a smart card OS uh, developed by IBM Zurich. 
uh, into the sixth development support responsibility. So that's that's one uh, in, in bubbling in Germany. Yeah. I only get one point right there. Um, so the J cop, this would be interesting. Um, now, what is open means we can, we should be able to see all of this, even if you cannot contribute to it. Um, <clears throat> <sighs> if it's still being handled by IBM, <clears throat> now that means that it's a um, pretty high level. Um, <clears throat> which, which is, which is not impressive. Is what I mean, in other words, um, <clears throat> I mean it's impressive in its in its own class, but it's not. Uh, Ubiquitous technology. Um, so, look for example the JCOB three point one. Let's just search for that. Let me search for it. See what I get there. Okay, here's the. And it's going back to Oracle. Um, the wiki should have everything. Formerly known as no, no. Uh, Java Card JCOB has a Java Card virtual machine, which allows it to run applications written in Java. <laughs> Two fifty-six bytes RAM, twenty KB ROM, and eight KB EEP ROM. That's unbelievably small. 20,000 bytes of read only memory. It actually has RAM also. That means that this, it has, this is the OS, and this is the real time processing that it's doing with the OS. This EEP ROM, I don't know what this is, 8,000, that looks pretty big though compared to the RAM. So this is electrically erasable, electrically erasable is type non-volatile memory that stores a amount, small amounts of data, retains data even when the power is off, making ideal for storing critical data, <clears throat> electrically erasable. So it's, uh, it's permanent, but can be erased so it's kind of like virtual memory except it's it could be permanent or temporary depending on what it needs so this one is temporary only this one is permanent and this is a temporary or permanent Visa MasterCard approved, NFC integration, so it looks like a lot of payment payment processing here. So, I mean, what does it do? It's just a technical overview, right? You know, what does it do? It has API, it can use API. ECC primitive calculation. I don't know what this means. Mm. 
you see we can see IC chips in the smart card <clears throat> type A 13.56 megahertz It's using proprietary encryption algorithms. NXP semiconductors from NXP semiconductors, which is from Philips. So the as a, as a payment processor type appears apparently I think um, that's why it has three um, three types of storage the <clears throat> the permanent storage which is the the OS itself the the RAM storage um, which basically is probably the uh, the real-time interfacing with the out with the external world and then you have the 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 permanent the erasable perm slash permanent storage which is probably like the account uh, if it is uh, saving money storing money and so on and counting how much money is on the account things like that also the encryption perhaps if the encryption changes encryption values change something like that so that is the actually um what are they going to do are they going to increase the uh, data storage sizes on those types of devices and they're going to while well, remaining um, discrete uh, so that's the future that they have there that they're trying to say Right, this one, so the operating system zoo. So it's a. I think what it's saying is that we should look for more for these types of operating systems, ones that are going to be very small in size, very directed, very purpose. Like they're they're only going to have one purpose. They're going to they're going to be on. <coughs> They're going to be very small in size, so they're not so so they're not physically detectable um, instead of having you know conversely inversely you have the you may have you know like a, a cloud like the what do they call that the uh, the AGI artificial general intelligence where everyone thinks that you've got you know some huge operating system that's operating somewhere that requires a huge data center or you know global data center no it's totally opposite from that the the, the <clears throat> if there is an agi it's going to it's probably going to be a, an aggregation of these smart card operating systems <laughs> something like that
And so we have these operation structure again. We have suggestions here, the monolithic systems, the layered systems, the microkernels, client server model, virtual machines, the exokernels. kernels. So the point is that the monolithic system is the least efficient, the exokernel is the most efficient. So what is an exokernel? And it is an operating system architecture that gives applications direct access to hardware sources. Exokernel architect architecture aims to maximize performance and efficiency by minimizing the abstraction layer between applications and hardware. Right, so it's going to be a skeleton type system. Uh, so kernel is an operating system kernel developed by MIT. See, all of these things happen in the U.S. Um, if it's and if it's not in Silicon Valley or in Oregon or in Washington, it's in MIT. See, to, to force as few abstractions as possible on application developers, enabling them to make as many decisions as possible about hardware abstractions. Exokernels are tiny since functionality is limited to ensuring protection and multiplexing of resources, which is considerably simpler than conventional microkernels implementation of message passing in monolithic kernels implementation of high level abstractions. So, what it's saying is. Yeah, you should making as little as possible, as little as possible. And uh, this is uh, September 2016. This is relatively old information. So, exokernel. Um, I want to check a couple of things here, first of all. <sighs> this book is... Um... This is a little indication of what's in here too, right? <laughs> Twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen and two thousand eight. I don't know which one came first. Two thousand eight <clears throat> So twenty fifteen was the 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 newest update. Uh, you know, if we ask about these extra kernels again, you know, like like uh, the that uh, Jacob uh uh, was written in Java. Um, so, now, uh, it's not a, it's still using one of the main languages, but it's not using one of the main, you know, OS types like Unix. So here's the Excel kernel here. Now this is this one thing is I don't I don't like it's always been slow I've never gotten some kind of virtual machine that was fast and uh, it appears that this exokernel strategy is a type of partitioning uh, and each user gets a partition so each user is getting an exokernel right exactly you see that right here see. So they're sharing the same hardware, and that is just that's just uh, I've never I've never had a fast experience with one of those. So at the bottom layer, running in kernel mode is a program called the Exo Kernel. 
You still have to allocate resources to VMs and then check attempts to use them to make sure no machine is trying to use somebody else's resources. See, this just, it's so fucking slow. I'm just, I'm just going to say it. I think the world of VM virtual machines is the world of, of, of idealism, ideology, ideology. <laughs> In, in, you know, it's the world of theory. In practice, it is fucking slow. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, I have yet to experience one that's not. <laughs> Each user level virtual machine can run its own operating system as on VM370 and the Pentium uh, 8086 except that each one is restricted to using only the resources it has asked for and been allocated. The advantage of the exokernel scheme is that it saves layer of mapping. Yeah, so if you're running this stuff on GPUs, then it would be different, right? But this is not, ex the, most of these, these uh, applications, as we already know, these applications, these OSs are going to what? If it already told you, it means that that's, that's the starting point. That's the last point that it was at, all right? You don't break the last point. So we're talking about, we're already talking, we're talking about exokernels on um, smart cards, essentially. So, uh, or, or, or OS is using as much resources as smart cards. Some kind of scheme like this. All right, so the advantage of the exokernel scheme is that it saves a layer of mapping. In the other designs, each virtual machine thinks it has its own disk, which blocks running from zero to some maximum. So the virtual monitor, machine monitor must maintain tables to remap disk addresses and all other resources. With the exokernel, this remapping is not needed. See, they're just talking about more effective uh, partitioning for uh, various users. And so for example, um, cloud applications like Amazon Cloud. You know, is it using this? Uh, it's using something, you know, better than this. <coughs> and so the point is, how can you have unlimited or effectively unlimited, you know, cloud space? Because it's using this type of uh, discrete uh, technologies. With the, okay, so with the exokernel, this remapping is not needed. The exokernel need only keep track of which virtual machine has been assigned which resource. This method still has the advantage of separating the multi-programming in the exokernel from the user operating system or code in user space, but with less overhead, since all the exokernel has to do is keep the virtual machines out of each other's hair, which takes a fuckload of, of, uh, of processing. And uh, if you try to do it on your personal computer, <laughs> It's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> all right, and then it goes back, and then it goes into into C. Uh, so you know, I don't know what's going on here. It's talking about the C language. So uh, I'm going to continue with the uh, process management. Uh, with, uh, anyway, I, I think I was. Um, I'm actually having a lot of fun reading these, reading the the the, in, the contents right now on the table. So um, I'm just going to continue with that. Okay, so we got the, the exokernels monolithic versus exokernels, right? You know, you see how it led into virtual machines? And then exokernel, and then exokernel, what is exokernel? It's a more efficient type of virtual machine. All right, so next. Looks like that is the int, right? And this was only chapter one. See how exciting that was? I mean, compared to the hardware, it's like, pfft just blows my mind you know and you see how efficient these these uh this architecture is i mean there's a lot i think there's a lot more work to do here than on hardware
All right, so to process and threads. Now, what what is process and threads? Where did they come from? Um, okay, so we passed through C here. We went through the, this VM exokernel into uh, talking about C, and then into uh, processes and threads. Okay, so obviously, what types of processes? Well, they're written in C. Right, that's what it's saying. So, uh, there's some notable mention of Java and Python there, uh, but uh, it's probably uh, I don't know what's uh, what. What did it say? Um, yeah. Okay. It's talking about what the differences are. And then see how it puts Python in, in bold. See, it means Python is the big one, and then especially Java. Java is based on C, so there are many similarities between the two. Python is somewhat different, but still fairly similar. All imperative language, data types, variables, and so on. It's just talking about it, talking about C. You know, what's the differences with that? So, um, but I think the main point why what it has here I hate that cover by the way but uh, the main point it's making is that using C we start talking about processes and threads okay so we're going to use C on what's in these processes is C all right so and then it says what about processes the model you know, process architecture, uh, and then to, uh, the process modeling multi-programming. You know what that is? What is that? Multi-programming is used. CPU utilization can be improved. And what is multi-programming? Crudely put, if the average process computes only 20% of the time it's, it is sitting in memory, then with five processes in memory at once, the CPU should be busy all the time. This model is unrealistically op uh, optimistic. However, since it technically assumes that all five processes will never be waiting for IO at the same time. And here it is talking about IO, uh, one of the OS Functions, main functions is I.O. management. Process management, memory management, file and I.O. management. We have I.O. right here, I.O. management. So the OS is here managing this I.O. problem. The skeleton of what the lowest level of the operating system does when an interrupt occurs. Uh, hardware stacks program counter, etc. Hardware loads new program counter from interrupt vector, assembly language procedures, stays registered, assembly language procedures, sets up new stack, see interrupt service runs, schedule decides when, pro when which process runs to next, see procedure returns to the assembly code, assembly language procedure starts up new current process. <coughs> A better model is to look at CPU usage from a probabilistic viewpoint. Uh, process spins a fraction P of its time waiting for IO to complete. With N processes in memory at once, the probability that all N processes are waiting for IO is P N, P to the N. The CPU utilization is then given by the formula one minus P to the N. So here we have CPU utilization as a function of n, which is called the degree of multi-programming. CPU utilization in percent. Now the CPU, I think, you know, my laptop and modern CPUs, we have multi-core, which means I think that each core can handle a different process. Um, so that could be multi-programming, but I'm not sure. I would have to, I have to go through this what's the degree of multi-programming 
So the 10th degree is, is what? CPU utilization, 100%. Uh, 100% utilization at zero. CPU utilization is a function of the number of processes in memory. Okay, so if I have 10 processes, then I have 100% CPU utilization. If process has been 80% of their time waiting for I.O., at least 10 processes must be in memory at once to get the CPU waste below 10%. So they're talking about waste. So You know, I have some uh, metrics here. I have a what? What is this? I have a CPU metric or something, and uh, <clears throat> example here. See CPU usage, and I'm, in, in other words, I'm wasting 90% of my CPU. I never thought of it that way. I thought it was just had 90% available to use. But um, why is it considered waste? I'm going to have to look more into it, but... Uh, Here's more of these stats. You can see each CPU is being used, but each one also has a lot of waste. When you realize that an interactive process waiting for a user types uh, to type something at a terminal is in I/O wait state, it should be clear that I/O wait times of eighty percent are more and more are not unusual. But even on servers, processes doing a lot of disk I/O will often have this percentage or more. Yeah, so the reason why it's called it calls it waste is not because of what a regular consumer, an average Joe consumer, is doing on his on his desktop. They call it waste because for places like data centers where the CPUs are constantly being used, twenty four hours every minute. And unfortunately, the CPUs are still in this type of situation. <clears throat> and then, so that's what I should explain here, um, how to fix that. So it says multiprogramming lets processes use the CPU when it would otherwise become idle. And then remembering the point also, right? So um, we're reading into f what it's talking about, but we have to remember the point. And uh, I think it was a 97 or something. But uh, anyway, the point comes from uh, this, the statement of contents. This must be no what the point is here. So we had 
we had modeling multiprogramming. And so it was talking about this, this problem, and then how to, so how to fix it. If multiprogramming doesn't fix it, then what fixes it? And that runs into threads. So, um, and then, so what we're trying to do here is maximize efficiency and um, efficiency in the, in the calculations that are taking a long time. And everyone knows that that is a big problem. And um, for example, you could be try, trying to use your computer uh, and you know it's slow because you're trying to process something that you know it uses, you think it uses a lot of your CPU, but actually it's, it is not. There's a lot of waste that is going on there. That that would be really um, not a good thing. With something you'd have to, something that would have to be solved. So, ninety-five, ninety-seven. I'm trying to think how I can have this. Uh, two of these opened. But anyway, we can see that there's a there's a disconnect here between the the um, the hardware and the software. So we have cores, but how are we using the cores? It's up to the software. You know, it's up to the operating system to um, uh, to use to use the cores. So, you know, it's, it's, so the question is, did the hardware, was the hardware designed or the hardware engineers designed something and then told the software engineers, this is how to, this is how you should write it? I mean, technically, I don't think, that, um, I'm sure there was a, you know, there's an equal collaboration, but, um, you know, or is it more of the process that the software engineers are telling the hardware engineers, look, we have these algorithms and we want to calculate data this way. So can you please design the processors to accommodate it? Um, which would be um, easier, which is more likely? Um, I think GPUs are an exception because uh, that was really something that came around um, and people are still, you know, fighting with. I mean, it's still not easy to use to use GPUs. Okay, so anyway, um, I, I I want to open another one of these uh, one of these. Uh, I wonder if I can open this again. How do I open this? <sighs> I really hate these PDF readers. Okay, let's try to open another one. <clears throat> Where the hell is it? Oh, come on, come on, come on. You RP. Okay. Let's see what happens. Open with, see, open with Acrobat. Okay, let's see if it opens it. Open it. See, it only gives me the same stupid. I already have it. Okay, let's try it again. Open. Gives me the one. It's, it's already open. You see? Stupid fucking idiots. Alright, so the point I want to make here is. Uh, We've got the uh, 
this is the this is the direction the vector and and this is the contents so let me go to uh, what do we have there yeah okay we're out there we're at the multi-programming right so 95 let's go to 95 and and this is this is how I follow as a book straight through all of it and I can tell you exactly what that what the point of the book is um, and you know so here uh, there's a lot of look at all this interesting information this is very interesting um, but uh, I don't want to get lost here so we go to 95 processes looks a lot like Linux yeah, Linux is an operating system right so but this is um, not only Linux this is just the operating system design here not just Linux design so um, I mean I read a system administration book that talked about Linux mostly and it would just <clears throat> talked about all of this stuff but this is you know, this OS <clears throat> OS architecture in the Linux so multi-programming 95 okay okay so we were talking about this Yeah, it's, it's talking about probabilistic models is uh, only an approximation. Uh, probability is a very good approximator. <laughs> it's probably one of the best they have. Okay, so here's a suggestion here about the single CPU. We cannot have three processes running at once. So a process becoming, but if you have three CPUs, then could you have three processes running at once? I have, I don't know what the, what it says right here, right? I have, uh, I have uh, 11, 11 cores. I have 11 CPUs. So that means I can have 11 processes running. You know, so does that mean that there are 11 processes running? You know, I could then I would uh, go to processes, and and see um, here is processes. So I mean, technically there are a lot of processes here, but they're using zero percent resources. Um, can line this up and we can see that uh, there's more than uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So there's more than 11 right processes. Um, but they don't need to use the CPU for very long. So that means that even though I have 11 CPUs, I have I still have many processes running through each of them. This one is probably, these first ones are probably on the first uh, CPU. But it looks like it's distributing it also, kind of. We've got CPU 10 here being used a lot, CPU, oh, look at that, we've got uh, uh, CPU 5 and CPU 0 and CPU 8. You can see it, you can see that uh, moving around. And I've got, I don't know what they say, I've got zero volts on the GPU. I don't know what's going on with that. I've got a GPU heat to 59 degrees, 59 Celsius, but is it being used? It's got no power running through it? I don't know. It's, it's, 
So anyway, um, you see it says thus the processes are not independent. So this is the point we are making multiprogramming lets processes use the CPU when it would otherwise become idle is of course still valid even even if the, the true curves are slightly different. So what's the problem? See, there's a problem. That's why we need the next section. Okay, it starts talking about maximizing the CPU uh, in, with multi-programming. It says increasing the memory will increase the, the CPU usage. That sounds interesting. So actually adding RAM increases the performance, the ability to use, to maximize the, the, the or to, to minimize the waste of the CPU, actually increasing RAM. No. Okay, so now this ran, that ran into threads. Each process has an address space and a single thread of control. In fact, that is almost the definition of a process. Nevertheless, in many situations, it is desirable to have multiple threads of control in the same address space running in quasi parallel as though they were almost separate processes. Okay, so multi threading, we've heard that before. So, multi threading, I assume, is superior to multi programming. multiple activities going on at once. <laughs> Quasi-parallel. Parallel processes. Parallel entities to share an address space. Share an address space and all of its data among themselves. <clears throat> and this is almost essential for certain applications, which means that in the future, this sounds very similar to those, those uh, new quantum computers, uh, which say that uh, I don't know what's it, what's in a uh, if you can get a, a very fast definition of a quantum computer uh, that would be an enhancement of threading you see qubits exist in a state of zero one both simultaneously using super superposition qubits become interconnected the state of one qubit can depend on the state of another, even uh, and then uh, what else? And so this is very much like this. Your 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 <clears throat> that theme is very similar to this. This thread, where it's essential for certain applications uh, for them to share ad for data to share address space instead of having multiple processes with separate address spaces. So a natural extension of that actually is quantum computing. Uh, and so, the, you know, so then the question is not, what will the use of quantum computing be? It, no, it already is, a, it's actually an extension of threading. 
So uh, we are already doing what the quantum computers will do. <laughs> it's just that they'll, they'll do the threading faster, they'll do it faster. <laughs> Okay, so this is not some kind of a spooky thing that they're trying to make work. This is actually based on the same idea, or the same algorithm that threading already uses, sharing the same address base and so on. So it's just a much more uh, advanced uh, physics structure of this of this type of uh, algorithm, computing algorithm. Second argument for having threads is that since they are, see, so there's actually no argument for this, uh, but anyway, I'll read this. Second argument for having threads is that since they are lighter weight than processes, uh, they are easier, faster to create and destroy than processes. In many systems, creating a thread goes 10 to 100 times faster than creating a process. When the number of threads needed changes dynamically and rapidly, this property is useful to have. So this is why this is the difference with software engineering and hardware engineering <laughs> because here we're asking well there's much finer i think distinctions and the the these distinctions can change much faster they can become much finer much faster um because algorithms are much easier to change, software algorithms are much easier to change, you know, in theories than hardware. Uh, so the threads are superior to processes. And so, you know, someone has to know the difference with threads and processes. And, uh, uh, you know, so threads are 100, 10 to 100 times faster than creating a process. So the third reason for having threads is also a performance argument. Threads yield no performance gain when all of them are CPU bound. But when there is substantial computing and also substantial IO, having threads allows these activities to overlap, thus speeding up the application. Okay, so thread architecture. That's what we're talking about. Finally, threads are useful on systems with multiple CPUs where real parallelism is possible. We will come back to this issue in chapter eight. It is easiest to see why threads are useful by looking at some concrete examples. As a first example, consider a word processor. So <coughs> just to make a comparison, I would say like when, what was the first CPU that using, th that uh, using threads was possible. See, practically enabled by the mid 90s, uh, the software based threading existed before this. However, these processors didn't have true hardware level threading capabilities. See, so I believe that usually the software architecture drives the hardware architecture but this was not the case with the gpus um, that was a freak accident and uh, i believe that it uh, remains to be corrected it is in the process of being corrected First widely available CPU to support hardware level multi threading was the was in two thousand two, right? The first widely available CPU was for for multi threading was two thousand two. Hyper threading allowed a single physical core to appear as two logical cores to the operating system, enabling it to handle two threads per core more effectively by using 
idle resources during cycles where one thread was waiting for data. This marked the beginning of true simultaneous multi-threading SMT in consumer processors. Around the same time, IBM's Power 4 and Sun UltraSpark CPUs also featured multi-threading capabilities with the UltraSpark T1, notably supporting up to 32 concurrent So the software idea was around for a long time and they were waiting for hardware manufacturers to make the hardware for it. At least 10 years, over 10 years there. I don't know, about, about 10 years. And these innovations laid the groundwork for modern multi-core CPUs. So this is the point, it's like, I mean, in, in software, we could be reading about these things that will happen in the future, but we don't have, the, but the hardware has not been engineered for them yet. We're waiting for the manufacturing. <laughs> All right, that's until the last cow are they now? Okay, so we've got the multi-core and SMT integration, most modern CPUs, uh, whether for whether for whatever, you know, device. Uh, so for example, uh, so we've got 464 core, a mainstream high-end consumer chips, each capable of handling two threads per core, effectively doubling the number of threads that can be processed at once. Okay, so this this means that if you if you have sixty four core CPU, it can handle one hundred twenty eight processes simultaneously. Hyper threading. Each where each core can handle two threads simultaneously. AMD on the other hand uses a similar technology called the, the SMT. Uh, allows physical core to operate as two logical cores, so it looks like the multi-threading is just at uh, two processes per per core. And you notice how it's talking about CPUs. Uh, GPUs do not have multi-threading, I believe. So we can ask: Do GPU have? Does GPU have multi-threading? I believe I uh, said no. Okay, it says yes, it does. Okay. So yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of information in between, but uh, this talk about quantum computers is a natural extension of multi-threading. And it's, it's gonna be uh, a much different enhancement because I heard that the results are instantaneous. It's uh, very <laughs> different from multi-threading. It's a, so, um, Massive parallelism, GPUs are built to handle thousands of threads simultaneously. Uh, each GPU core can execute many threads in parallel, making GPUs. Oh, okay. And a typical GPU board has many cores. So if each core, anyway, there's, I don't know, there's like hundreds of thousands of cores on a GPU. So if each of those cores can handle uh, thousands of threads simultaneously, or is it, is, are they talking about the board? 
I'm not sure. Each week you can execute many threads, but it says many, so I don't, I don't know how many it is. This probably means the board. This means the core. Yeah, this is this is insane. I mean, if you can effectively use a GPU, there's there is no comparison to if you're doing data crunching. Uh, using a CPU that would be stupid, uh, effectively. <laughs> you're talking about thousands of times faster. Yeah, extremely efficient parallel tasks. So it definitely would, I mean, benefit if you want to save time. You have data crunching, and you want to save time doing it. Um, which you know, a lot of popular, let's say, machine learning algorithms, uh, like that. I think it's called the ARMA or something, uh, which are considered uh, dependable, uh, but slow algorithms, uh, are would be very practical on GPU and not practical at all on a CPU. So, absolutely. It, it's, uh, it would be, it's a, it's a very, it's very beneficial to use, uh, to learn how to use a GPU, learn GPU. Very big advantage. I think it would be the difference between having a <laughs> I don't know a personal ATM machine Also, a CPU typically has a few cores, up to 64, right? Each capable of handling two threads. GPUs have thousands of smaller cores uh, with, with lightweight multi-threading, each with multi-threading. Yeah, it says that uh, ML and AI tasks like matrix multiplications, which is the which is the core of AI is ML and AI is these matrix is is uh, matrix uh, matrices is well suited to the parallel processing patterns of GPUs. So GPUs are excellent at matrices and matrices is the core of ML and AI so it's a perfect match it's an excellent match and that's good because it actually says they they have a drawback um, 
it says right here, it says, but maybe less efficient for workloads requiring complex logic or frequent branching. So I, I don't know what would, would do that, but for the most part, I do know that for the most part, these matrices and linear algebra is the core of ML and AI. So that's a, that's a perfect match. And that is, that's not going to change either, as far as I know, anytime soon. <clears throat> so anyway, these threads, uh, this is for the CPU only, and this is for POSIGs. And so a question I can ask is, uh, is the GPU in here, right? We were still talking about process management here, right? But... Uh, what does it say? Does it say anything for GPU? We've got 23 instances of GPU, so it does. And then we'll talk about that. And this is in, uh, let's see where it goes. It's in chapter one. Uh, and we've got chapter one again. How much it talks about it. Where this is in 2015. Uh, Multiprocessors. In what? Chapter eight. One eight. See, common and scientific computing. That's all we need. <laughs> and then nothing. So a very small mention in chapter eight, chapter one, chapter eight, briefly, that's because they didn't have, they didn't know how big it was going to be, I think. That was about eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, and for this book to heavily like just miss GPU, that's, uh, I mean, for operating systems, for anything, and it's, definitely either they didn't know what was going, gonna happen or something but uh, you see modern operating systems right this is the book and uh, written by this person So this is fourth edition. We just take I'll see for all formats and editions, right? As so we keep using this circus theme, I don't know why. Um, this is twenty twenty four. Huh, case study Linux Linux and Android case study. So anyway, these books are by him. We got computer networks, distributed systems. Uh, 2010, 97, 2012. Uh, if I can go by date, let's see. So by featured by publication date, 24. This is the newest one. 23, 23, 22. I, I uh, let's try this one. Um. Ten dollars. So I got I got a Tannenbaum twenty four. Uh, this is a global OS or something. Uh, so I'm gonna check this for um, GPUs, of course. Um, check this out. Um, got the same thing. It looks it, it looks repetitive, like the same type of uh, contents. Um, and you see that right there? This is very similar, almost the same. Uh, but uh, I'll check GPU. Check GPU. Only six.
and then it ran to chapter eight again. It looks very similar, this new book. Oh, then it just accepted, it adds in TPU and NPU, right? So let me try TPU and NPU. You see, it didn't have that. It's just, it just, uh, this new version is just insert the name of a new technology, but like not much more description was given about the GPU. Um, See, unfortunately, programming GPUs efficiently is extremely difficult and requires special programming languages such as OpenGPL or NVIDIA's proprietary CUDA. This is this is 2024. This is, I think, isn't 2024 this year? It still is. So, uh, yeah, this was printed uh, this year. Um, but anyway, um, definitely worth it. But like I said, it's still specialized. A freak accident in the hardware world i think it is meant for mass conception con consumption but the idea didn't start with the uh, software engineers and so everybody is adjusting to it right now um still has a way to go So anyway, very depressing, uh, very uh, useful to specialize in that. Um, but I'm just going to continue with process management here. Um, OK, so it's called the process management. Fork is a good place to start a discussion. Fork is the only way to create new process in POSIGs. It creates an exact duplicate of the original process, including all the file descriptors, registers, everything. Sounds very similar to the fork in Git. And is there a relation? I believe so. Um, the creator of Git is also the creator of Linux. Um, and he uses, if the fork is a term used in Git. So, it, I guess, um, he borrowed that from from this from this uh, I think I think it's his fork from POSIX I don't know but we can check it out let's see let me ask let me get all this stuff get all this stuff uh, now they have this book that's that's interesting that's cool um, is a fork from POSIX. Hello, wake up. Now, fork system call is part of the POSIX standard. Uh, was it uh, was it first created from POSIX? Okay, I didn't understand what I said. Oh, okay. Because uh, was. Uh, Fork, which created for process. No, Unix. Yep, that makes sense. So, <clears throat> Linux borrowed a lot of Linux borrowed a lot of terminology from uh, from Unix that's where he borrowed all that stuff from all right 
Not that NASA is right down the street. <laughs> I pass it every day almost. What is this? Tomorrow? $28. I don't know. I'm going to sleep. Okay. Um, whatever. Let's keep going. Process management. Okay, so since I know the, what I want to do here is, since I know um, the three parts, what did it say? The, the Process memory file. These are the three parts. Question was Describe the three main functions of an operating system, analyze the usage and role of operating system. Okay, so now I need to go into more depth of each. <clears throat> okay, and then it, of course I need to stay in the uh, 250 word boundary. That's later. So process management, so I'll ask it, what I should have done is I should have asked it to explain this more deeply. That's what I should have done. Instead of getting off topic, I should say explain this more deeply, then explain this more deeply, then explain this more deeply. And now what it's gonna do is tell me, sorry. What can I help you with? Okay. It's forcing me to buy. Oh, look at that. Oh, okay. Something went wrong. No, okay. Didn't used to be this limited. Okay. I am. process management more deeply on this see it actually cited the book 
and now that I have a new one I'm not sure I want to use this I think I want to use the newest one I should use the newest one okay so nine okay okay so what do we have we've got three Fundamental function of the operating system plays a central role in the overall performance and stability of the system. Creation of processes, scheduling of processes, scheduling of processes, creation, scheduling, termination, efficient CPU use, process isolation, into process communication, process states, Scheduling queues, multi core, and parallel processing. Now, I would have slightly better information if I used the 2024 edition, I think. And uh, that means <laughs> that my assignment would be slightly better. And they would be slightly happier, probably. Um, so. I am definitely going to start um, <clears throat> referencing the book. Uh, and it's very interesting. You can see this uh, this terminology here that we don't see in the hardware. For example, reincarnation server. That is obviously Indian, Indian term. You would not see that in hardware. I'm not trying to be racist, but it does seem, at least in the past years Chinese were more attracted to hardware and Indians were more attracted to software that's a very racist thing to say but uh, possibly very true too Hopefully it changes. Hopefully it is uh, will change. Okay. So anyway, uh, sixty-seven. I want to get to um, site reference um, and uh, this uh, history downloads. Yeah. Okay. Downloads this one. And. Uh, Tannenbaum here, Tannenbaum, uh, modern library systems. Then it's uh, fifth edition, global edition. It's going for uh, 2024.
Pearson. Or New Jersey. And uh, BOS, standing bottom boss. How do I cite two people? That's a start. Anyway, it's um, it is uh, the point is this. The point was this information here, this multi-core and parallel processing. So as far as processing, I want to make sure I get these points in here. This is just for the processing though. Um, so the the. first point was this So um, I'll start it out that way. And I don't know why this is an indented and this is not indented. This should be indented, I think. This is indented, this should be indented. Oh, that's why I've got 260, 260 250 right there. It's indented, but, okay, so let me, up here. Indented, yeah. And task one is over. <laughs> now two point one is task two. Task two has a title. Oh, I should put it. Point one task two here. Process management. Pro okay, I'm gonna put the process memory file not and okay, use capital tiles file, right, which is a file slash file slash io. File and file and IO management. memory file and IO okay that, I don't I don't think that's clear enough so I'm just put process management memory management file and IO management or the three main functions
process, then this will go to this. So process management it can be Creation, scheduling, termination. Duration processes, creation, scheduling, and termination of processes, efficient, uh, efficient uh, CPU use. Okay, but here this involves creation, scheduling, termination of processes, efficient CPU use, process isolation. Isolation, IPC, inner process communication. Process states, scheduling queues. Multi-core, multi-core and parallel processing. Then this would this will lead into the other one. This is just for process management. And the memory management, right? So this right here is forty words. This is no, this is high. No, how much room I have? No, I'll put here process management. Involves creation, scheduling, termination of processes, efficiency be used, process isolation, IPC, process state, scheduling, queues, multi core, and multi core and parallel processing. Period. Okay. And then I do the same thing for 
I will just do the same thing for See, explain process management more deeply from this, right? So I'll take this and then I'll do explain memory. Now I have this set. And that's 120. That's about half of what I need. So the other half is explaining in more detail these things. All right, let's go to the next. See you next time. Next session, next time.